Welcome back to another video lecture with Mr. King and Mr. Baver, who's sitting here, although you can't see him. Today we're going to begin our studies of the 1930s and the Great Depression, um, picking up where we left off after the stock market crash of 1929 and the disastrous consequences. And of course, after exams, we're ready to get back to life uh, as normal as possible as, as we can get. So here we go. We're going to look into the 1930s. And the goal of this video lecture today is to provide you with an introduction to the 1930s, what I call a lost decade. Again, a lost decade. You see that up on the screen there because of all the things that were going on in the 1930s. And we can also uh, look at this image of a camp. These were called Hoovervilles president at the time was Herbert Hoover. He was elected in 1928, a Republican, who was wed to sort of the traditional ideas and values. That is, the government should not really get involved too much in the economy. People should pick themselves up, uh, work hard, rely on their own good uh, strength and skills, and not expect too much help uh, from others. Uh, and so we're going to look at that as we go through this lecture. Um, the other things in the 1930s that we want to be aware of, and you should try to jot these down in your notes as we begin, factories closed, stores closed, millions of Americans were unemployed, there was incomprehensible human misery, hunger, people suffering from a lack of decent shelter, as you can see very clearly from this picture. Those are very crudely made shacks out of wood, corrugated metal, whatever uh, people could get their hands on. And so we see that the American dream had sort of dimmed, lost its luster. The 1920s, of course, a decade that we call the Roaring Twenties, booming, lots of people making money, factories churning out new appliances, cars from the Detroit auto factories of Henry Ford and General Motors, among others. And the idea was that hard work uh, in, in the United States would lead to material success and prosperity. And what we see, though, is, again, closed factories, closed stores, failed banks, lost savings, and crushed hopes and dreams. And I think that's a, an image, crushed hopes and dreams, that we'll come to uh, again at the end of the lecture in a song and a poem by two, a uh, songwriter and a poet that we'll see in a little bit. So the idea of the American way of life really comes to a screeching halt. The idea of blue skies are replaced by gray skies. Now. Uh, to be fair, as we move forward, there had been recessions and economic downturns before the Great Depression, uh, but those depressions uh, or recessions were not as severe and not as long-lasting. Therefore, this depression in the 1930s has the label or qualifier of Great Depression. It's going to last about a decade from roughly 1930 to 1940. And it's really not until World War II comes along that the United States is able to really pull itself out of the depths of this Great Depression. The other thing I want to leave you with is that the 1930s and why we should really study the 1930s is because I believe, and, and other historians believe as well, that it's one of the three most important decades in the brief 230-year history of the United States, ranking up there with the 1770s when our nation was born, the Civil War in the 1860s when our nation almost uh, disappeared, and though the Union won the war, so our nation was reborn, and then we have the 1930s. And so we want to look to the 1930s as one of the three most important decades. And I think in the 1930s what we see is a new birth. Uh, that is a birth, the birth of a large modern state in which the government, the national government, and its elected leaders take a very active hands-on role in managing the economy, shaping the economy, and trying to secure the well-being, economic and physical well-being of the people. Now, what does that mean? That's a rather abstract thing. So the, the new birth of a modern state where the government is actively involved in protecting the people and promoting their well-being, that's got to sound a bit strange, and I, I, it should. It's, it's something we have taken for granted because today we live in a society that uh, has so many different programs and agencies to help people in times of need and crisis. But that wasn't always the case. So really one of the things we want to find and look to uh, understand is how the Great Depression really changed the shape of the United States government, the scope, its powers, and what people expect from the government and their leaders. So that's what we're going to do. Take a brief break. Be right back. 
Okay, we're back. So here's a really interesting political cartoon that I think will also help us understand the importance and relevance. And again, we always want to, when we study history, it's not just about learning the history and the past, but it's also thinking about how the past can help us better understand the present, inform us, instruct us, guide us, and again, always how we can learn to be more humane and sensitive to the needs. So you see this, this political cartoon, Depression Lesson, starring Herbert Hoover, Franklin Roosevelt, and introducing Barack Obama. Because as you know, we're currently living through what was called the Great Depression, and we're still trying to get out of that, turn the corner. You also see people going into this theater to see this show, to learn the lessons of the Depression and how they might apply today. You also see a man selling apples from a cart on a street corner, which is a common thing when people couldn't get jobs, uh, apple uh, apple pro uh, yields had been very abundant, so people would get apples for very cheap next to nothing and then try to sell them on the street to make a living. What we also want to then think about is, so if Obama is studying the 30s as he is, and, and a lot of people study the 1930s for lessons about how we can avoid uh, depressions and what the government can do, we need to back up to 1930 and, and remember that prior to 1930, governments really just weren't involved in managing the economy that closely. That wasn't part of the traditional thinking. So we need to remember the term laissez-faire uh, that we saw when we studied the late 19th century and rugged individualism. Laissez-faire meaning leave it alone. So it's not the job of the government to interfere with the economy. The government's job is to leave the economy alone. People, individuals are supposed to rely again, as I said before, on their strengths and their wits to get ahead. But this all changed in 1930. And it really also changes thanks to a British economist. So now we're going to drag in somebody from England, John Maynard Keynes. And he's, a na he's, he's somebody you should know. You should know this name. You should write this down. Maynard Keynes, John Maynard Keynes, produced a whole theory that said when times are bad and, a, and an economy goes into recession and or depression, that is, jobs disappear, factories close, goods aren't sold, it's really the job of the government to begin providing money to people so that they can work, so that then they can buy goods, and that will get the economy going again. And so this is called prime the pump economics that John Maynard Keynes introduced in the 1930s, and he had a big impact on Franklin Roosevelt. So one of the lessons of the Great Depression, as you see that sign there above the, the, the movie theater, is that when the economy goes into repre uh, depression and or recession, the government should actively get engaged by creating jobs, providing people with money so that they can consume. And that's exactly what we're going to see with the New Deal. Now what about this guy Herbert Hoover? He was the president from 1929 to 1933. He did not really embrace John Maynard Keynes and this new approach. He was more rooted in tradition. So think about the 1920s. We saw the conflict between the Bible and science and Darwin in the film Inherit the Wind, we have the same thing now in economics. To a certain extent, Hoover was rooted in the 19th century ideas. Again, laissez-faire, rugged individualism, limited government intervention, as I say, old school. Though what's interesting was Herbert Hoover was a great food relief administrator in Europe after World War I, so he does have a more sensitive side to him, but he was a self-made millionaire uh, working in engineering and mining and he really applied those uh, principles of his own personal life to his political life and to the presidency and he uh, has a hard time adjusting to the realities of the Great Depression as they became more apparent and so therefore he was a great failure and so not many people look to Herbert Hoover when uh, the economy is bad. Um, they, they really try to run away from Hoover and avoid Hoover and his legacy. And they look more to Roosevelt. And you see Roosevelt here using the new radio as a device to communicate with people, something he did often and he did well. Roosevelt was able to really connect to the people. Uh, think about the modern presidency and what a modern leader does. Um, and, and this is what he did. So he's going to give people hope. He's going to give people confidence. And he's going to give people what is called the New Deal. Now, Roosevelt is a distant cousin of Theodore Roosevelt, the first modern president we discovered and studied in the Progressive Period. And remember, Theodore Roosevelt had a square deal. Franklin Roosevelt is going to come along with a New Deal. And that is going to say, look, the old ideas, those that 
Herbert Hoover practiced of laissez-faire and rugged individualism, individualism are just not up to the task. And so Roosevelt is going to announce this bold new vision using the powers of government and public money in, in ways that had never been done before to try to get the economy going again to get people back to work and get people spending again to end poverty and misery. And so that's really going to be uh, FDR's legacy. And uh, as I said, Barack Obama, George W. Bush, uh, all presidents in the modern center are really going to study uh, Roosevelt's legacy. Now, Roosevelt was a Democrat, and, and so for the rest of the 20th century, the Democrats are going to be uh, living in the shadow of Roosevelt, and that is a big, more robust, powerful government. Republicans are going to come along and, and disagree with these ideas, but in the end, uh, very few of these Republicans have actually taken action to undo Roosevelt's uh, achievements in the New Deal, and I think that's worth uh, focusing on. You might have some questions about that for us in class. But at this point, I think we've reached the end of this video lecture at 11 minutes. Uh, I will just flip over here. You can look at these two poems uh, or song lyrics, A Dream Deferred by Langston Hughes, a Renaissance Harlem poet. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun, fester like a sore, and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust over, crust and sugar over like syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load. Or does it explode? Powerful lyrics. You guys can look at that. Uh, and I think I might even post the Prezi for you. And here's another song, Brother, Can You Spare a Dime? And I think if you read the lyrics, the idea is blue skies are gone, gray skies are here, people didn't have money, and it was uh, not uncommon for people to ask their neighbors, their friends, relatives for money. And a dime at the time, 1930s, uh, was a lot more than it is today, a couple bucks maybe. So you can look at now people uh, turning to their neighbors, turning to their brothers and sisters, looking for help. Um, and I think this song does a good job of that. So thank you very much. Uh, please write down any questions and we'll discuss those in class. Thanks.